Beautiful, amen. What a blessing it's been to be with you the past few nights. God is good, amen. And what a ple- pleasure it is to begin this Sabbath, to enter into his rest with you uh, this evening. I tell you, it was a blessing getting a chance to meet a lot of you down there at the ABC. And, you know, it's just amazing how um, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody, right? In the Adventist church, it's a small family. And one individual came up to me and stood in front of the booth and he said, you remember me? And immediately I remembered my, my third and fourth grade teacher from Athelton Elementary School in Maryland That was pretty cool, Uh, but it's just been a blessing getting a chance to get to know each and every one of you, and what a special conference and camp meeting we have here, amen? My subject tonight is when God talks behind our back. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you for the awesome God that you are. May you be glorified, may you be uplifted, may you shine above everything else, I pray that uh, lives may be changed because we have been with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In John, the first chapter, verse 15, it says, John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. And now we fast forward to Matthew, and notice what it says. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? So notice here we have the one who just got done saying that Jesus is the one, now asking, is Jesus really the one? And if we're honest, everybody here has felt this at different times in their life. Moments when we wondered, is he really who he said he is? Is my salvation really as secure as the Bible says it is? Is his forgiveness as full as he says it is? Is his promise as secure as he says it is? You see, it's easy to say Jesus is the one in the beginning when things are going well. But can you say it years later when you're in a place you don't want to be? It's easy to follow God when he's going in a direction you want to go. It's easy to say to God be the glory, great things he hath done amidst the great things. But can you say it from a prison cell? Let me tell you, friends, when I hear these stories of China, we need the saints from China to come over here and teach us what it means to be missionaries for God. Because we can't bribe people to come out to church. It's easy to say, it's easy to say to God be the glory, great things he hath done when we have the comforts of this life. But can you say it from a prison cell? God put a powerful calling on John the Baptist's life, amen? Amen. I hope you know God has put a powerful calling on your life. And that is why the day you were born, the enemy put a target on your back. The enemy wouldn't attack you if he wasn't intimidated by the plan that God has for you. And so in Luke 3, 18, and with many other words, John exhorted to the people, and he proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all, and he locks John up in prison. So check it out. Herod puts John in prison in order to silence him. I hope you know the enemy tries to do the same thing with you. He wants you to put you in a prison in order to shut up your praise. I'm not talking about maybe a literal prison. I'm talking about a prison of debt. 
Maybe a prison of depression or a prison of problems. Maybe he wants to put you in a prison of bitterness and pain, of anxiety, worry, or regret. You see, the enemy knows if he can put you in a prison, he can silence your praise. Now, John didn't do anything wrong to end up in a prison. In fact, John's in a prison for doing the right thing. Doing the right thing does not guarantee you're going to end up in a place you want to be. In fact, what John doesn't yet know in Matthew 11 is very soon his head will be removed from his shoulders and placed on a platter. So can you really blame the guy? (laughs) Can you really blame John for asking, are you the one who's to come or should I look for another? John's essentially saying, Jesus, why am I still in prison? Maybe you've asked that question, Lord, why am I still hurting? Lord, why do I still have all these problems? Lord, I've returned the tithe. Why am I still broke? Lord, why am I still not married? Or maybe, Lord, why am I still married? (laughs) Don't shout, don't shout amen to that one. I gave my life to you, Lord. Why am I in prison? Why am I still addicted? Why am I still getting rejected? Why why did I get sick? Was all that preaching for nothing? Was all that church going for nothing? Was all that tithe returning, Sabbath keeping, vegetarian casserole eating for nothing? You see, it's easy to end up in a prison when God doesn't meet our expectations. You know, you always took care of your body, but you end up with cancer. You you treasured the marriage, but you end up single. You were faithful with your tithe, but you get audited by the IRS. Lord, did I go through all that for all this? I never got to enjoy that delicious steak dinner. And I got the heart attack. I sacrificed to send my kids to Seventh-day Adventist schools, and they left the church. I met my spouse at AdventistSingles.com. And they turned out to be a wolf in sheep's clothing We'd be lying if any of us said we never felt the way John is feeling. Because whenever reality collides with expectations, we are often left wondering why. Think about it. Instead of following Jesus and seeing all the miracles that he was prophesying about, that he was preaching about, instead of seeing all those miracles, okay, John's rotting in jail, and, and one of the, you know, and, and that's the thing about jail. Jail, you know, one of the times I was in jail, and, and, and I was in jail because I deserved to be in jail, but I remember waiting for my parents to come to bail me out because I had called them and pulled on those heartstrings, and I talked to a lot of you today, talked about this tough love, you know, if you've got an addict in your family, and you've you got to give them tough love because some of you are loving them straight into the grave, And so I was pulling those heartstrings, and kids know how to pull their parents' heartstrings. They know how to do it, and so I was doing it. I pulled out all the stops. Mom, you got to come get me. And I, and I called her, and, and I thought to myself, okay, nighttime came. Any minute, she's going to be here to bail me out, just like before, nothing. You know, and then I waited and kept waiting and kept waiting. She never came, and then the next morning came, and instead of getting me out of jail, my mom just left me a note that said, Richie, we are done bailing you out. Say, what? (laughs) I was in jail for doing the wrong thing, and my expectations weren't met. Imagine how John felt. And this is why in recovery we say watch out for expectations because you see expectations are the breeding ground for resentments. The good news, friends, is God doesn't meet our expectations so that he can meet our need and manifest our miracle. 
And the prisons of John's day would have made our prisons look like weekend resorts. First century prisons were basically a hole in the ground. No window, no light, no comforts. Think about it, John is in a very dark, lonely, cold place. Sometimes life can be a dark, lonely, cold place. And you know what can make those hard times even harder? Is knowing that good things are happening on the outside. That was the worst thing about one of the times when I was left in jail that time is my son was celebrating my oldest. It was like his third year birthday and, and I was looking out the tiny little sliver of a window and watching people drive by and watching the freedom and knowing my family was celebrating my son's birthday and I couldn't be there. The worst part about being in jail is knowing people are out there free and having a good time. But here's the thing, you don't got to go to jail to experience that. If you've ever had a child addicted to drugs, when everybody else's kid seems to be on the honor roll, you know what that feels like. When everyone says happy Sabbath, but you're not happy, you're hurting, you know what that feels like. You know what it feels like if your relationship is falling apart and everywhere you scroll on social media, you see the Brady Bunch. But you got to remember, friends, the veneer of social media, they're just showing you what they want you to see. You're not seeing the hurt and the habits and the headaches and the, and the heartaches. They're showing you what they want to see. Don't judge your insides by other people's outsides. When the grass starts looking greener on the other side, that's the Holy Spirit telling you to water your own grass. It's just not as good as they make it look like. Lord, I did what you asked. I lived how you told me to live. I obeyed like you asked me to obey. Why am I still in prison? But friends, I've got good news for you tonight. We can praise God even from a prison cell. How? Well, I believe the key is in verse 7. Notice it says John's disciples were leaving and Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Now I've probably read this scene, seen it a thousand times and never saw this before. But check it out. It isn't until after John's disciples leave that Jesus begins talking about John. He begins talking about John behind his back. Now, usually when we talk about people behind their backs, it's because we're insecure and it makes us feel better. But Jesus was perfect. He was not insecure. He was the most powerful person who ever walked the earth and the most humble person who ever walked the earth. Sometimes we talk about people behind their back because we're too scared to say it to their face. But when you read the Bible, Jesus didn't have that problem. He called them hypocrites. He called them things like, you're children from hell. He says things like, no, no, your father is not Abraham, it's the devil. He called them things like blind fools. You think your pastor's rough? They ain't got nothing on Jesus. <laughs> you're trying to get rid of your pastor. Man, Jesus wouldn't have lasted a day in your church. Jesus didn't have a problem saying it to your face. So why does Jesus wait until John's disciples are gone before he starts saying the good stuff about John? I believe it's because John, Jesus didn't want John putting his faith in John. Jesus wanted John putting his faith in him. You see, we live in a world that puts a lot of emphasis on people's abilities, on people's performances, on their results. And that's why actors and athletes are often our heroes. But there's a problem with that. You see, when we only depend on good IQs, we get what only a good IQ can do. And in the case of some of us here, that's just not that much. When we depend only on good leadership, and let me tell you, we got some of the best leadership in the world right here at Georgia Cumberland, but when we depend only on good leadership, we get what only good leadership can do, and it's not enough. When we depend on talent, we get what only talent can do. When we depend only on our good looks, we get what only our good looks can do. And in the case of some of us here tonight, that's not much. Our morality isn't enough for the miracle that we need. 
But if we would start depending on an awesome, all-powerful God, we will get what he can do. You see, natural ability isn't enough. Your obedience isn't enough. Your performance isn't enough. Even John's commitment to Jesus wasn't enough. John needed Jesus' commitment to him. John did not want, Jesus did not want John depending on John. He wanted John depending on Jesus. And if you're depending on anyone tonight other than Jesus, you're depending on the wrong person. Look, I'm a big believer in affirmation. I don't believe we tell the people we live with, work with, go to church with enough. I don't believe we tell them enough. Good job. Did you know to every one positive thing people hear over the course of a day, they hear 10 negative things? See, I I believe in affirmation. I believe we need to be more affirming to our families and to the people we work with and go to church with. We need to say, good job, great job. Affirmation is good, but dependence on affirmation is bad. You see, God does not want us dependent on the praise of people, but on the person of Jesus Christ. Because you see, the praise of people is fickle. The people were shouting Hosanna at the beginning of the week, and by the end of the week, they were shouting crucify him. God does not want us dependent on the praise of people, but on the person of Jesus. And this is why I believe we will never know in this life all God has done to us and through us to reach other people. You see, he doesn't want us dependent on our abilities, but on his ability You see, I have no doubts in my mind that if for one day I did not fall on my knees and say all to Jesus, I surrender. If I at any point stopped doing the things that I do today to remain free, I'd go right back to the place I was. That daily dependence on God. God knows I can't be dependent on my abilities. He wants me dependent on his abilities. You see, God doesn't want us dependent on a particular response but on a particular relationship. We don't keep the Sabbath because we're better than anyone else. We keep the Sabbath so we can get to know Jesus better than anyone else. And if you're keeping the Sabbath because you think it somehow makes you more suitable for heaven, there's a surprise coming. My professor said there's going to be three surprises in heaven. We're going to be surprised some people are there. We didn't expect to be there. Some of the whores and the hillbillies, the hotheads, the dopeheads. We're going to be surprised some people are not there that we expected to be there. Some of those people that were at the church every time it was open, but they never surrendered their heart to God. They were going to themselves as their Savior instead of their Savior, Jesus. And then the third surprise is we're all going to be a little surprised we're there. (laughs) Because we know the sins of our own heart. You see, people who ground their faith in a result will lose their religion when they don't get the result they think they should have had. But when we ground our faith in a particular person, even if terrible things happen, we know that we can never lose our relationship with Jesus Christ. When our hopes in people and predicaments, we end up in a prison. But when our hopes in a person named Christ, well, we can praise him even from a prison cell. Which is why instead of giving John praise, Jesus reminds John of the plan. Notice Matthew eleven four 4 through 5. It says, And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. John, the plan is working. The Holy Spirit is falling. The power is overflowing. The blind are finally seeing. The deaf are at last hearing. You see, I don't need to know how God's going to work that situation out. I just need to know that God's got a plan. I want you to say that with me. God has a plan. God has a plan. You want to praise God tonight? Get your focus off your problems and your predicament and get it on the plan that Jesus Christ has. God says, I got a plan for the cancer problem. 
God says, I got a plan for the politician problem. I got a plan for the prejudice problem. God says, I got a plan for the depression problem. I've got a plan for the unemployment problem. Man, Jesus says, I got a plan for the death problem. Very soon, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Hallelujah, I can praise God even from a prison cell when I remember, hallelujah, God's got a plan. But then check this out. This is really cool. As soon as John's disciples leave, Jesus turns to the crowd and says, okay, now let me tell you about my boy, John. See, God is talking about him behind his back. Check it out. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Jesus starts bragging on John. I want you to know something tonight, Georgia Cumberland. I believe that Jesus is doing the same thing about you. You may never hear it from people. You may never hear it from the, the elder or the pastor or the parents, but you need to know that our God is talking about you behind your back. And the first Peter 1 Peter 1.12 says, The things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. That word long is this interesting Greek word that means to desire, desire something with such earnest the closest word we may have to it is lust, but it's not in pure form of lust. It's this pure form of just the angels, of all the things the angels want to hear about, of all the things the angels have to look at, golden street, uh, seas of glass, pearly gates, of all the things the angels have to look at in heaven, their favorite is the plan of salvation, God's love for humanity. You see, you need to know tonight, heaven is rejoicing over you. Heaven is celebrating over you. Angels are high-fiving over your victory. Your church may not celebrate the small steps, but hallelujah, God up in heaven is celebrating your small steps. In Luke 15, at the end of the parable of the lost coin, Jesus makes this statement. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over just one sinner who repents. Luke 15, 10, in the message paraphrase, it says, Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. God loves talking about us behind our back. And so friends like John, you may not be able to see it, you may not be able to feel it, but you need to know God's talking about you behind your back tonight. You know, for years, I was afraid of the judgment. For years, there were a couple of uh, 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 week of prayer speakers who had terrible theology and scared a bunch of young kids of their Savior. For years, the judgment was a frightening thing for me. I remember hearing those different people speak on that pre-advent judgment and, and thinking, man, ain't nobody going to make it to heaven. You ever heard a sermon like that? Ain't nobody going to make it in. All those old pictures of, 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 of people standing there in the throne room of heaven with their heads down. And they seemed almost frightened. They seemed almost scared. And, and I would imagine God going through the list of my sins. And let me tell you tonight, it's a long, long list. And I, and I would imagine God, you know, this idea that God was going through those to find one unconfessed sin. You better confess all your sins or else God's going to zap you. And I imagine him going through all my sins, finding a reason to keep me out. And so when I would get up off my knees after praying and confessing my sins, I was still nervous. I was still unsure of God's love and salvation. And I would sin again, and then I'd ask God for forgiveness again. I'd sin again, ask God for forgiveness again. Please, 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 please don't blot me out of the book of heaven. 
Lord, give me one more chance, and I promise this time I'll do it right. I'll never do it again, only to, guess what? But then one day I started to understand what Hebrews 12 was getting at. When it says that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, in Genesis, this is an allusion to Genesis 4, 10, when Cain's brother spills his brother's blood and the Lord says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. That when innocent blood is shed, it it cries out to God from the ground. In fact, it says in Revelation 6, 10, They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? It's the same idea of these martyrs and their blood that has been shed crying out to God, calling for justice. Hallelujah, we serve a God of justice, amen? We serve a God of justice. No bit of abuse will go unnoticed. No bit of injustice or hatred or prejudice or racism misses his eye. We serve a God of justice. Innocent blood calls out to God for justice. But there's a problem with that. Our sin caused the death of God's son on Calvary. And therefore, it calls out for justice for us too. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it says that the wages of sin is death. You see, the price of sin is death. But the beauty of Christianity, the beauty of Christianity, the beauty of our religion, our relationship that that doesn't exist anywhere else is that instead of making you pay for the justice, pay the price, Christ paid it in your place. And that's why the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant into the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, Abel's blood cried out for justice, but Jesus' blood cries out not only for just justice, but for justification. Abel's blood cried out for condemnation. Jesus' blood cries out for our vindication. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them when God talks behind our back. As my uncle used to always say, God's uttermost for my guttermost. You see, this is the beauty and the blessing of the judgment. Judgment, my friends, is not bad news. It's good news. (laughs) It's the best news. Because check this out. In 1 John, it says that Jesus is the propitiation. This is a word that implies payment. Jesus is the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. One drop of Jesus' blood is enough to cover every sin ever made. As long as that sin is confessed, it is covered. Don't you see, if Christ paid for your sins, God would never, ever, 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 ever condemn you. Because he's already received payment and atonement for that sin. You see, Jesus' blood not only cries out for justification, but for justice. The Bible says that not only is God's faithfulness on our side, but his justice is on our side. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I see too many people ask for forgiveness claim Christ as their Savior, and yet continue to try to earn God's favor and forgiveness. But friends, if Christ paid for my sins, that means I don't have to. If I receive salvation as a gift, but still somehow have to merit my worthiness for heaven, if Christ's sacrifice on Calvary was perfect, but I I have to still somehow produce a perfect sacrifice... If Christ was the perfect atoning sacrifice, but yet I have to produce in me a spirit of perfection, then why do I even need Jesus? You see, that would be unjust. That means if I have to pay for my sin and Christ pays for my sin, that would make God unjust, requiring two payments. 
You see, friends, the only way God can be perfectly just and yet absolutely merciful and gracious, the gospel. Because in the gospel we see Jesus take the penalty of that, all the penalty that sin deserves. And yet give us mercy and grace of what we do not deserve. And this is why, my friends, the judgment is good news. And this is why I can stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not with my head down low. Oh, please, 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 please let me in. No, 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 no. I can stand before the judgment seat of Christ with my head held high. Judge me, Lord. Judge me. Judge me. Please talk about me behind my back. Church, stop basing your salvation on your performance and start basing your, your, your salvation on Jesus' performance. Stop basing your faith on where you are right now and start basing it on where he is right now, vindicating you before the throne. Think about it. John never saw the miracles that he had preached. He never got to eat miracle fish sandwiches. No, the guy got prison slop and yet Jesus says of him notice he says no one is greater than John the Baptist you see we live in a world that says God is good if you drive the nice car if you got the nice house if you get the promotion if you've got a good bottom line but friends you can praise God even from a prison wearing camel hair clothes and eating bugs and honey You can be alone in a dark and dingy prison and still be the richest person on the planet. John, whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare a way before you. This is talking about John the Baptist. You see, friends, John can't see the fruit of his work, but if it wasn't for John the Baptist, people would not be ready for Jesus. You see, John is doing so much better than he realizes. Maybe today, like John, you're in a prison. I call it the not enough prison. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not thin enough. I don't read my Bible enough. I'm not at church enough. It is the never enough prison. You need to know tonight you are doing so much better than you realize. Because just the fact that you made it here tonight is a miracle. Just the fact that you tuned in tonight is a miracle. The Bible says that, 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 that the Father has to draw us if we come to Christ. So just the fact that you want to draw closer to Christ is proof he's working dynamically in your life. Your friends, we got to get this thing tonight. The message of the gospel is that when we weren't enough, Jesus was. From Calvary, Christ declared, it is finished He didn't say, I've started it, now you finish it. But that's the theology of some of you Adventists. I started it, now you finish it. God didn't say, good luck, or I hope you make it. He said, I did it. You see, the, see, Calvary is the crossroads where the author, the founder, became the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. We need to remember it is Jesus that is the finisher. Every demand was satisfied in him. Every type was fulfilled in him. All things were consummated in him. In John from Calvary, it says, Jesus knowing that all was now finished. Not some of it. Jesus did all of it. Cecil Rhodes cried as he laid on his deathbed. So much to do, so little, to, so little done. But Jesus declared from his deathbed to tell us it is finished. I love my church, but I see too many of us with salvation schizophrenia. We're saved on Sabbath and we're lost again by Sunday. Saved, lost, saved, lost, saved, lost. I can say tonight in the blood of Christ, I am saved. I have total confidence, not in me, but in Jesus Christ, my Savior. 
Stop running from sins that God's already forgiven. Stop running from shame Calvary's already taken. Stop working for a salvation that's already been given. Jesus' words from Calvary wasn't do, do, do. It was done, done, done. Through God's amazing love, we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Don't you see, heaven is not going to be filled with perfect people. Heaven is going to be filled with purchased people. The essence of the gospel is that when we weren't enough, Jesus was. I believe some of us need to give ourselves a break tonight. The more we try to earn salvation, the more miserable we are. The more you try to earn your salvation, the more, the more you will feel unsaved. Yeah, but pastor, I'm not where I should be. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Ain't a single person in this room is where they should be. We should have done finished the work, and we should have been having this camp meeting in heaven. Ain't none of us where we should be. Welcome to the club. And you know what? When the enemy tries to invade my spirit and say, Richie, you're not where you should be. You're not, you know what I say? You say, yeah, you're right. But at least I'm not where I used to be. Living out of my car. Uh, uh, another dope, another hopeless dope fiend. But hallelujah, God turned me into a dopeless hope fiend. I may not be where I should be, but hallelujah, I'm not where I used to be. Life is tough. And like John, you're going to find yourself in dark, cold, lonely places. Let me tell you, friends, the days are getting darker. And there's going to be moments when you're going to wonder, like John, are you the one who's to come or shall we look for another? And in those moments, you better hold on to the light of Christ. Because not long after John prepared the way for Jesus with his life, John would prepare the way for Jesus with his death. Truly I say to you among those born of women, there is a risen no one like greater than John the Baptist. I'm sure John would have loved to have heard that while he was alive, but he never did. John didn't see the difference he made, but he made a way for the Savior to come into the world. Parents, you will never see the difference you made but you made a way for the Savior to come into your child's life. Couples, you will never see the difference you made in your spouse's life, but you may be the only reason your spouse makes it to glory. You made a way for Jesus to come into their life. We will never know the difference we've made, but knowing that we're making a way for Jesus should be enough. John made a way for Jesus. You see, John matters so much more than he realizes. I want you to know you matter so much more today than you realize. John was never alone in his prison, and neither are you. Hallelujah. Behold, I have engraved you in the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your pain is my pain. Your problems are my problem. Hallelujah. When God talks about us behind our back. Now, we may not hear it or see it in this life, but one day when we stand face to face, we'll hear it on that day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the, your master. Now, friends, do you think for a second when John hears that, there'll be any regret for the pain he felt in this life? The answer is no way, and neither will you. Today, through this story, the Holy Spirit is telling us I was using you when you felt useless. I was changing hearts through your hard work. I've turned your mistakes into stepping stones into glory. You may not be able to see it now, but one day you'll see it. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Friends, the reason... John the Baptist, the reason I didn't spring you out of prison was so the next thing you would know is resurrection. 
Oh, according to Ecclesiastes 9.5, come on, Adventists, the dead know how much. Which means the very next moment of John's conscious thought will be the awareness of his Savior calling him forth. In a moment, he's going to go from kneeling at the chopping block to kneeling before his king. He's going to go from losing his head to Christ putting a crown on his head. In an instant, death is going to be swallowed up in victory. you got to let that reality swallow you whole right now. The beautiful sufficiency of your Savior. Allow that to swallow you right now. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light and I shall look upon his vindication. Man, the whole world can condemn you, but who cares if Christ is vindicating you? Hallelujah. God is talking behind your back. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you and praise you for all that you have done and all that you are doing in the lives of your people. And Lord, right now, I, I, I pray that you would pour your spirit on each person here, that each person here would invite your, the blood of your Son to cover them completely. That we would see tonight, Lord, through the power of Scripture, your word, that if Jesus paid for our sins, you would never require us to pay for our sins because that would be double payments and you are a God of justice. Lord, I pray today we would see that the only way we can serve a God of total justice and holiness and of mercy and grace is the gospel. That we would see Christ high and lifted up tonight. I pray that you would draw close to us as we draw near to you, Lord. That you would fill each heart here, that each person here, maybe they walked in here tonight and they didn't want to come, but you brought them here tonight. I pray in the quietness of their heart they will say, all to Jesus I surrender. That whatever the decision that each of us have to make here tonight, whether it's to make a recommitment to that relationship, maybe it's to forgive that person who hurt us, maybe it's to set some people free, maybe it's to leave this camp meeting on fire with the gospel, maybe it's to step into the water with you. Lord, whatever that decision is tonight, I pray we would make that decision right now and we would walk right up to someone and, and tell them that decision that we've made for you tonight. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, we might leave here as new people because we have been with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.